My name's James. I'm, uh, like Craig, a medical oncologist. Um, mine will be, my presentation will be a little, a little bit more practical. Um, and I've been asked to talk about selective topics that I get asked about quite a bit. Um, firstly, who am I? Um, as Craig mentions, we're, we're the chemotherapy doctors. We're probably the, I'm not going to say the least important doctors that people meet during their cancer journey. We're probably the last people that people meet. Obviously, everyone meets the surgeon first and then usually the radiation oncologist, and we're probably the last people that people talk to about the, other fa about the different ways of managing their cancers. Um, I'm probably the doctor that people know the longest or see the most, probably, um, because of how often I have to see people while I'm managing their treatment. Um, and I suppose when I first meet people, some of them, well, they're there to talk to me about chemotherapy. And uh, some of them expect me to be a bit like a used car salesman and try and sell them my lovely drugs. Um, I believe in chemotherapy. Why do I believe it? because people on average are more likely to live longer. Um, and people who respond to the chemotherapy, or at least if the, if the cancer stays stable, stay better for longer and the symptoms don't get worse. And in a small proportion of people, the, the cancer actually can shrink and people can feel better. Um, why do we know all these things? One, because of the experience we have with them, but also because people have been through the clinical trials that Craig was talking about. Um, can you hear me? Oh, apologies, sorry. I usually have a really loud voice, so I apologize about that, though not quite as loud as Craig's. All right, would you like me to start again? <laughs> all good, all right. So that's why I believe in, 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 in uh, chemotherapy. Um, and as Craig said, that's, it's because of people who haven't gone through clinical trials that we know that our drugs work. Um, but what are our drugs? And what are the medical oncology drugs? Unfortunately, they're poisons. Um, there's no easy way around that. Um, and when we actually give people poisons, we have to be very mindful of what we're um, hoping to achieve and what the potential consequences of that are. Um, the problems with chemotherapy, look, they're toxic. Um, the more symptoms someone has from their cancer, unfortunately, the more likely they are to run into side effects from our chemotherapy and less likely they are to be able to manage those side effects. Um, and unfortunately, some of the drugs we use, especially the temozolomide or so, we, we quote, you know, a 10 to 20% chance that people could end up being admitted into hospital with side effects from their chemotherapy. And unfortunately, some of those side effects can be life-threatening and involve prolonged periods of time in hospital, which is obviously not, not what we want when people are in the situation um, of having a brain tumor. Um, the other problem with our drugs is that they don't work for everybody. Um, as Craig, when he presented his graph of the, all the different people and the large kind of bell curve, unfortunately the trials are specifically designed about the average as opposed to the individual. And so we dose our trials based on what we think on average is going to work as opposed to what will work with you. We don't yet have the, that capability to say this drug will work with you at this time, or more importantly, this drug won't work with you at this time. We're getting better at that, but there's still a long way to go. So that unfortunately, even though we use our drugs willy-nilly, sometimes we make people unwell, and sometimes we give it for no reason because the drugs don't work. And unfortunately, even if the drugs do work, eventually they stop. Um, we're just hopeful that they'll work for as long as possible in individual people. Those are the problems with chemotherapy, but I still believe in it, and I still think it works, but in the right people. And that's why I try and tell people that my job is to individualize their treatment. And my pure goal, especially with the people with the high-grade gliomas, is that my job is to try and keep people as well as possible for as long as possible. The priority is on the well. I can poison anybody. The question is, is whether that's of use to you. Um, how do I do that? Look, I have to assess you physically. Is chemotherapy going to do you good, or is it going to do you more harm? And that's important. And I, I suppose one of the other challenges that we oncologists face is that we also have to manage people psychologically. And I've got to be mindful of people's hope, but also be realistic about what we're dealing with. And that's difficult, and there's no easy way to do it, and there's no good way of doing it. Um, we're constantly learning. Um, that's chemotherapy. And I'll move straight on into another topic, which I get asked a lot about, steroids. 
We love steroids. Most of the patients in this room will have been on them. Um, they're a godsend when we give them. The problem is they can be horrible. Um, why do we like them? This is just an MRI of uh, someone's brain tumor. The actual uh, tumor is, uh, I'll point it out. Huh? Oh, yeah. Does that work? Oh, yeah. And the purple bit around the outside is, you, is most commonly when we see it swelling. Um, the tumor itself isn't that large, but when you can't account to the swelling, it's three times the size. Now, the problem with swelling, and the way I describe it to people, is that picture a bee sting or a wasp sting, you get a big red welt. But with the skin, the wet welt goes outwards. Unfortunately, within the brain, there's nowhere out for it to go and so it starts compressing the normal brain. And that's why people get a lot of symptoms. And steroids are really useful in reducing this swelling. And that's why when we give it, people actually feel better and their symptoms improve. Um, so that's why people notice a significant improvement in the vast majority of times when we give, this, when we give the steroids. Um, the problem is, is they can be horrible. Um, Long term, they can cause significant side effects. They thin the skin, make it prone to bruising and tearing. Um, I've, I've seen people fall while on long term steroids and end up with, you know, shreds of skin along their, along their legs. Um, they can increase the risk to other diseases like diabetes and infections. They can be body changes. Um, most people think when we talk about steroids, the first thing they think about is him. Um, no. Um, we horrible doctors, we tend to use terms, and this is terminology in the medical literature as to the, the, the effects that long-term steroids can have. Um, they're not pretty. Lemon on a stick means someone who's very, very round with very, very thin legs. Moon face is a, a situation where your, your, your face kind of gets rounder. Uh, and buffalo hump is when you actually end up getting more fat up here. Um, those can be a problem. Um, and most doctors can easily spot someone who's been on long-term steroids. The main concern I have with steroids is that the longer you're on them, the weaker your legs are going to be. And the main problem is, is that it actually makes the muscles here weak. So getting in and out of a chair, going upstairs, getting off the toilet becomes increasingly difficult the longer you're on them. And people, I, I've got patients who unfortunately um, are significantly, their mobility is significantly affected, not because of their tumor, but because of the steroids that we've had to use to control their swelling. That's a real problem. So in view of that, we always kind of say these are the fundamentals of steroids, both the good and the bad. If people have worsening symptoms and we think that's due to their cancer, well, look, go ahead, try steroids. And what I tend to say is, look, take one tablet twice a day, morning and lunch for three to five days, and if you feel better, excellent, it's worked. If you don't feel better, stop them, because taking them further, not gonna help you. If you do feel better, start trying to get off of them. So start weaning them down. Have them, you know, first they go to one tablet a day for a week, go to half a tablet a day for a week, and see if you can go to every other day. And eventually we try and go down and down and down and get people off of them. If we can't get you off of them, we'll, we'll usually play around with doses, trying to find a really, really, really small dose that we can Keep you, keep you well um, without making you unwell. Um, driving. Um, this is a new topic for this year. Uh, last year, uh, Lorraine, our, uh, our uh, social worker, talked about it, but she's not here today. So um, questions I get asked, um, the most common one is, can I drive? Um, rarely, I get asked, should I drive? Um, and I've never been asked, may I drive? <laughs> um, unfortunately, this is the law. The holder of a driver's license must, as soon as practical, notify the Road Transport Authority of any permanent or long-term injury or illness that may impair his or her ability to drive safely. And it's the patient's responsibility. Um, what do we talk about? Unfortunately, as a consequence of a brain tumor, and its diagnosis, and usually the presenting symptom being something like a seizure, 
that has an impact on people's ability to drive. If you have a seizure, you're not eligible to drive. If you have one seizure, you can conceivably get your license back after six months of being seizure free. If you have multiple seizures, it should be 12 months. And the important thing here is, is that you need to get medical clearance to get back to driving. When you're actually diagnosed, the first thing that we do is actually open up your skull and actually get part of your cancer. That's a craniotomy. The moment you have had a craniotomy, you then have to report that to the RTA. Now, after surgery, if you have no deficit, it's up to the surgeon to decide whether you're at risk of seizures and whether you should be able to drive. And if so, you can actually get a medical clearance to drive relatively soon after an operation, usually six weeks, depending on the surgeon, but that's the surgeon's call. If you have a deficit, and I'll go through what a deficit is in a second. If you have a deficit, there's no driving for three months, all right? If your deficit improves, then we can give you a clearance and you can drive. If your deficit doesn't improve and it's determined to be borderline or not, sometimes we have to refer people to an occupational therapist to do a driving assessment. Sometimes we just say, look, you shouldn't drive. What is a deficit? Unfortunately, there's a long list of what a deficit is. And it's sometimes not clear to a patient why we think they are eligible to drive. People can understand, look, if I can't see, I can't drive. One of the biggest issues that I have is sometimes people don't have the insight into their disability or the judgment to make the right decisions when they're behind the, 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 the wheel. Um, that's rare. Most people do have this, but these are the sort of disability, the, sorry, the deficits that we uh, clinicians go through when assessing whether someone's fit to drive or not. Now, we clinicians are not infallible, and if we say, look, you can't drive, uh, that's, that, unfortunately, we will always do document that. Um, there are ways around us um, or in consultation with us, and occupational therapists have a very large role in getting people back onto the road because they actually go through a very, very intense assessment of watching people behind the wheel of a car and making a, a determination as to whether they're fit to drive. The problem is, this is not free, and this is for a cost. However, this website actually lists all the different driving, driving occupational therapists um, available around Newcastle. Um, I looked at it six months ago, and there were three. Uh, I looked at it as part of this presentation, there's 20. Um, but so there's, there's plenty of people out there. The assessment probably costs about 500, 400 to 600 bucks. Um, but that's valuable when actually going back to the RTA to ask whether you can drive again. Um, this is from the RTA website and it actually demonstrates the kind of reporting processes for people um, when, they're, when, they're when they uh, have a condition that uh, may impair their ability to drive. The actual reporting process is usually from the patient or the driver to the driving authority. Um, very rarely do health professionals ever talk to the DVA. Um, I've, I've done it once where I've flagged to the DVA that I had a patient that I thought should not drive. And despite multiple conversations, he lacked the insight. Um, and so I canceled his, his license over the phone. Um, but I've only done it once. Um, so that's a method of last resort. Um, why do we go through this? Look, the problem is, is if someone's got a condition which will affect their ability to drive and they have an accident, the consequences of that are you can be held criminally and civilly responsible for the accident. If you have a condition that hasn't been reported um, or you've reported and drive all the same, you can be held, you can be sued and be put in jail and you can be fined. Um, your assurer won't cover you. All right, that's important. Um, and the one that I go on about with my patients is what about the other people in the other car? And that's the important thing. I always, the way I put it is what happens if a five-year-old jumps in front of your car, are you gonna be able to stop that? Um, we're aware of the significant impact on people's independence when we say don't drive. We don't do it lightly, but our priority is the safety of both the patient and those around them. Um, cannabis, last topic. Um, 
Craig put up a, 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 a website. Um, I did a little search. Gotta love these studies, you know. Cannabis oil cures cancer without side effects. Brilliant. Um, an eight-month-old eight got cured from his brain tumor with cannabis. Excellent. Um, Newcastle Herald, cannabis oil stopped my cancer. Um, this is difficult. This is a problem for me. Um, when people do, unfortunately, one of the first questions I ask several people when I see them for the first time is, how much Dr. Google have you been doing? This is Dr. Google. There are really good websites out there. The Cancer Council's got a section developed uh, on, on uh, medicinal cannabis. This is probably the best information that people can find. It's relatively new. Um, it's available through the TGA, which is the Therapeutic Goods Administration of Australia. It just gives guidance on what medicinal cannabis is. Um, this, these documents have been produced by a uh, large group of clinicians, researchers, and more importantly, patients to help guide how Australia will actually move forward into this sphere. Um, in general, what this document mentions is that, look, cannabinoids, they've been around for a long time, you know, purported use of cannabis has been over the last 3,000 years. We do know that there's about 100 active ingredients or active kind of cannabinoids within a cannabis plant. Um, the two most kind of purported to be useful clinically are THC, which is responsible for why people feel well on cannabis, the high. Um, there are clinical trials that have been done to look at whether it reduces nausea, pain, and muscle spasms. And it also might help improve uh, sleep and appetite. The other type of cannabinoid out there is CBD. This doesn't give a high, and actually might actually have a calming effect, um, but it also might help with seizures and pain. And there's all kinds of other things that are currently being trialed. What products are out there? Look, with most drugs, we do things where we think this drug might work. So we'll go through the tests, and yes, it works, so we can, we can get it. Unfortunately, with cannabis, we're backwards. People can get cannabis now. The question is, does it work and does it help people? The problem is, is there's a lot of people in the cannabis sphere. Um, you can get different products with different concentrations of different drugs. So you can get THC only products with some with small concentrations, others with really high concentrations. You can get CBD only products with, again, varying concentrations. You can get THC and CBD with different concentrations to address different symptoms. And then, with all those concentrations, you have about eight different ways of actually taking it. So you can take it smoked, it's frowned upon, um, vaporized, um, oils, tinctures, sprays, tablets, patches, gels, all these different ways of actually taking it. Um, the problem is, is we don't know what to give, when to give it, who to give it to, and how much to give. Um, where are you going to get it from? Realistically, you need your own drug dealer, all right? Um, there are three ways of actually getting cannabis in New South Wales at the moment. Unfortunately, the most common way is your own, having your own little Pablo Escobar. At, most people can find them, even a couple of my octogenarians have found the good old Dean down the road. Um, when people source the cannabis themselves, what I tend to do is suggest they enroll in this scheme. Um, this is a New South Wales uh, compassionate use scheme run through New South Wales government. What I tell people is that this is kind of a get out of jail free card. When people are enrolled in this scheme, if they get pulled over by the cops and they're carrying cannabis, the cops have the option to not charge people. There are caveats to that. If you're being a dickhead, they will charge you. If you're driving, they will charge you. Even if you're on this, you're still not allowed to drive. Driving while under the influence of cannabis is still illegal. So bearing those caveats in mind, this is still a good program. And several of my patients are on it. It's pretty easy to enroll. It's a one-page sheet for the patient. And the important thing about this is it covers both the patient and their carer who can help source the drug. The problem with it is that you need a medical clearance for it. And as part of that, the clinician, who can be anyone, has to actually say that you have a terminal illness. Now, they define the terminal illness as an illness which basically will eventually result in the death of a patient. 
I'm quite comfortable signing this off. Um, and I've enrolled several of my patients on it. It doesn't give timeframes. So I'm quite comfortable. And at the moment, it needs to be renewed. It used to be that, be that you'd have to renew the scheme every year. They're now actually releasing it so you have to renew it every two years. Um, and I'm renewing it very regularly for several of my patients. So this is the way I actually usually recommend cannabis. The thing about this is that I say, you need to take it for what you're actually really looking to. Uh, I, I, I tell people why I think they should take it or why I think they should not take it, but I'll talk about that in a second. Another way of actually getting it, look, doctors can prescribe this now. The issue, there's two ways that doctors can prescribe it. They can register themselves as prescribers of cannabis. That list of registers involves a vetting process done by uh, the government. There's only a few people on that list and it's not publicly available. The other option, and so what that means is basically one doctor can actually prescribe to any number of eligible patients that he sees are eligible. The other option is a doctor can actually do a patient specific prescription. That, which means that any doctor can actually prescribe it to a signal patient. Again, the question remains what? Um, this is difficult and involves a very, very keen doctor because there's a significant administrative burden and they have to be shown to actually be useful. Um, lastly, you can go on a clinical trial and there's several clinical trials looking about cannabis and specific indications. Um, I don't prescribe cannabis. I don't prescribe it as a medicine. Um, to be registered as a medicine in Australia, a product has to be shown to be safe, effective, and a quality product. I don't believe that the cannabis available and being talked about meets these criteria at things stand at the moment. Is it safe? In the vast majority of people, yes, but it can induce psychosis. Is it effective? That's the big question. Does it work? Look, the high quality clinical sti studies are lacking. Might it be effective? Absolutely. And when we, when we talk about effective, what does effective really mean? Craig was going on about cannabis as an anti-cancer agent. I don't believe that. The evidence, there is absolutely no evidence to suggest that cannabis has an anti-cancer effect, despite what Craig was saying. Will we find cannabis-like agents which might have an anti-cancer effect? That's yet to be determined. But I don't think it's an anti-cancer effect. However, I think it's absolutely got a role in the symptom relief of my patients. Can I quantify that? No, I can't. Last thing is a quality product. You want to know that if you're prescribing a medicine, they're getting the right drug with the right concentration in the right way that it's going to actually give them a benefit each time that they actually fill their prescription. We don't have that yet. Um, and how, what do I give? How do I give it? Those sort of things. We haven't actually done those high quality studies as to what the method of administration and at one concentration is best, though those are happening. Um, that was it. Sorry, I'm run over time, so uh, I went through things quite quickly. I apologize, but I'm happy to ask questions when we're, uh, when we're done. Thank you.